Okay. All right. This is a thank you. Okay, here's the background. I am a manufacturer of the sweetest sled <laughs> that ever was. Not a snowmobile sled. Let me get the shine off of my shiny head. Okay, not a snowmobile sled. It's still shiny. Okay, not a snowmobile sled. A sled sled, like, you know, Citizen Kane, uh, Rosebud style sled, right? Okay, but I, yeah, I got to be careful about using the word sled because for me, sled is snowmobile. Just like a motorcycle is a bike, a snowmobile is a sled. But I really consider these sleds. So I need to change my language for these. And I think so that I don't confuse sled because they're both used in the snow. So, like, I, I'm thinking of changing when it, just for the self-referral when I talk to you guys, you users who are using these around the world and for your expeditions. I'm going to start referring to them as a lot of people got this one. And actually, our next uh, effort is just going to be the snow wagons. 63. It's insane. So we we made the box smaller and that lowers it somewhat, but it's still like a huge price increase using through the um, U.S. Postal Service because the U.S. Postal Service had dimensional rates, but the dimensional rates uh, were more kind of very coarsely stepped. There were large boxes, balloon boxes, and oversized. We were always at the limit below uh, length plus width plus width plus height plus height. So length plus two widths plus two heights, I think it had to be less than about 84. Well, as of January 1, I assume, 2020, that's done. It all goes dimensional. So a big box that's light is going to cost more than a box that's, say, one inch, one cubic inch smaller that's, that's smaller. So that's called dimensional pricing. UPS and FedEx have been using it for a long time. Now the post office is using it. I'm not going to get into politics. I have my complaints, but, you know, whatever. I have to pay $7. If I get it through the post office, it's actually even about $10 more. The cheaper price is when I use one of the online aggregators so that you can buy your posters for them. It's cheaper. I'll just tell you the name of the company. I'm not endorsing them. I'm not whatever. I buy the poster from stamps.com. Okay. That's, I just buy it because it's cheaper. Is it a great service? It's okay. The interface is fine. I don't have any complaints. I'd rather buy it directly through the post office. If it was the same price on stamps.com and on the post office, I would rather go to the post office just because I feel like I get a little bit extra level of service. Um, when you buy a stamps.com, they use their own infrastructure to some degree. So when you buy it through the post office, you're getting soup to nuts. You are, you are getting your front office uh, interface or they've come to your house sometimes to pick it up. You're getting the logistics, you're getting their, in some cases, they contract out. They use somebody else's trucks, somebody else's airplane, but it's through the U.S. Postal Service. And the last mile from FedEx or from the UPS, they're, they're using computers to figure out the cheapest way to get you that package. So when they go to the U.S. Postal Service, it doesn't cost them 70-something dollars to, to, ship that, uh, to ship that sled. We don't sell it through Amazon. You know, maybe that's something we should consider. I don't know. Um, but... Uh, we don't sell through Amazon, so it cost us $67 to ship it. Okay, unfortunately, uh, unless I come up with another method like a distributor network or something, I can't really sell those sleds right now. Given that, all the people who bought one, you're still getting it. Now, one person in particular has sent me an, uh, an email saying, let me know the difference in your shipping cost and I will cover it. Like, that is so freaking generous. That to me, that's just outstanding that somebody would be so generous that they would go to somebody in their community. I mean, to me, that just says, oh, he's not just buying something from me. He's, he supports what we're doing. I don't get that from, I mean, that, it's, a, it's a tiny community. I'm not saying I don't have anything against brick and mortar stores with the and exceptions of some companies. Some have been fantastic in New York City. I don't even know if they're still there. They were amazing, really super nice people, reliable. They paid on time. It was a pleasure. Also. Um, uh, there's another art supply. I'm going to have to look it up because they were really, really wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to look. I'll have to, you know, I can't see now that I mentioned these people, I'm going to have to tell you the names. I should be. Oh, Jerry's. Jerry's art supply. Okay. So Julie had as good of a luck. I, I think there's kind of a, um, 
we've experienced kind of um, a lack of interest, which for me is really odd. I mean, I'll go in some of these stores and most of the stuff in there is made in China or Japan, some cases Austria, and very little of it is made in the United States of America. And to me, it's almost like it, it ours is not just made in the United States of America, it's made in Golden, Colorado, okay? So this is, this is made in a certain way and yet I can't really get respect for the product here. It's really weird. I have customers asking me to ship these to Japan and Australia, I don't get that one at all. How much snow is there in Australia? I guess maybe in Tasmania there's some, but apparently people aren't just using these for snow. They're using these for a variety of other purposes, I guess sand and anything where you'd use a sled. So, uh, th this you this supporter comes and he's like, yeah, let me know the difference. I'll cover your postage because the postage went from like you know seventeen dollars up to sixty seven. It's a big difference, but I mean it's not a big deal. We're absorbing it. It's okay. And the small these little ones didn't go up much at all. They went up a few bucks. That's fine. It's it's fine. I don't look at that as a bad thing. I'm not happy with the U.S. Postal Service for jacking up the rates, but that's a story for another day. I'm going to send a letter to. Um, the Wall Street Journal or something like that, I guess, because they're always uh, interested in things like this. I, I in my opinion, the, there are two halves of the post office, and co Congress mostly agrees with me. There's the mail side, which is which is um, uh, media, books, um, letters, bills, periodicals. Okay, and then there's the parcel side. So the, the letter side is very strictly controlled by Congress, and the parcel side is more Congress said, look, use that as a, as a moneymaker for the mail side so that we don't have to sell that off and so that people can, 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 can keep getting their mail wherever they live in the country. But the parcel side is like, do what you have to do to make a profit. So I get it. The post office is doing just what Congress said they should do. They've got to maximize the profit from their parcel side business. But – I feel like from a business perspective, the United States Postal Service is missing an incredible opportunity, okay? Because they're not like Amazon, they're not like UPS, they're not like FedEx. Actually, there's right now they're the way UPS was in the 1970s, arguably, that's really the case. UPS was, was a, a private company, but they conducted, they, they held themselves to standards that was the way the post office would. The standards for management, very high standards for um, uh, compliance, legal compliance. They were kind of like a second post office in a way. So that a lot of people, Americans don't really remember the way UPS was. You actually would be cheaper to mail a package through UPS than it was through USPS. But the way it is now, UPS can't and FedEx can't possibly compete with the U.S. Postal Service in their parcels because UPS is essentially um, piggybacks on the mailing division. So they're using the trucks. They're using the logistics centers. They're using the um, – the, they don't have their own planes, but they're using the commercial flight contracts to get letters around the countries. They're using the uh, computer networks. They're using these things. I'm sure there's some demarcation. The point is we have to remember the mailing site is ours, okay? That was defined in Congress. The, po the parcel site should also be ours. That shouldn't be, in my opinion – that shouldn't be privatized, okay? Because there's an opportunity for all kinds of Americans to use that at a lower cost. Well, the second you, uh, you, you, you talk about what value is the U.S. Postal Service, well, the U.S. Postal Service is to me as a small business person and the kind where my customer actually sends me an email is like, oh, let me cover the cost with you. That's the kind of business person I am. The, the personal relationships and the community relationships that I have with the people who are interested in these products are more valuable to me than the quantity. Okay. So that's the way I run my business. And I'm fortunate like that. I get customers calling up and asking to take their wallet out and give me more money that I didn't even ask for. Ford isn't going to get that. GM's not going to get that. IBM's not going to get that. That's called somebody who supports you in an ideological way. Okay. I mean, Apple probably used to get that to some degree. To some degree, I was probably one of them. You know, I, they, I was, uh, I was, this was back in the night, early or mid 1990s. It's like that was the only machine that would do what that did. Anyway, I'm not going to get all into that. Point is, um, I believe there's an opportunity for the U.S. Postal Service to to use the community who's 
impacted by the rapidly escalating costs to the point where it's going to put some people out of business. I mean, it's killed that product for me. And that's a great product. I can't really can't realistically sell that unless I made a bunch of money real quick and somebody was, and I was able to lower the cost of it somehow to the point where I'd be able to absorb the extra shipping cost. Or I could also go through Amazon, but that's a big nut I'm not ready to crack yet. I mean, they're a great company and all. I'm just not ready to, not ready to do all that. Okay. So, um, so the opportunity is if the post office could use the community that's impacted most by these high costs, the people who rely on the post office, small business people like me rely on that post office. They rely on it. Big businesses, I'm small business people may rely on FedEx and UPS. I'm sure it's true. And they can, some of them can probably get good rates, but somebody who's maybe more uh, creative, roughly the same through the years, I'm not going to see dramatic increases because it's a, <clears throat> what they call a quasi governmental. So it's Franklin. I mean, if, if there's a socialistic resource, I guess it is Ben Franklin, you lousy socialist. Okay, whatever. I don't care. All right. I don't want to get all into politics. If the U.S. Postal Service parcel division, remember, which is not the mail division, there's very high standards that have to be upheld there. Okay. Somebody sends you a bill or a legal contract, it's got to get there. But all these parcels, if they get there in the tracking number and it's lost or something like that, they can figure it out. This is a manageable cost. If something gets damaged, it's a manageable cost. But I think that that's a mistake, is assuming that if the post of the U.S. Postal Service uses micro entrepreneurs to deliver that last mile, and even in some cases deliver long, long tracks so that they can bid out on what the U.S. Postal Service is buying the same way that Amazon does it, the same way that FedEx does it, the same way UPS does it, and DHL and all these, the same way all these big companies are able to bid out and do work for the U.S. Postal Service, we should be able to do that. And if we could do that, then the Postal Service is no longer stuck in this position of being like, well, our parcel service has to support our very expensive mail service, which it does, all right? And because the mail service can't stop. We, ha we can't have this future where somebody who lives in, in the remote uh, uh, coasts of Maine or in the forests of Oregon or in the mountains of uh, Wyoming can't reliably get their mail. That's very important. They need to reliably get their mail and it needs to come through. And even when they have internet, they still need mail. This thing might turn off. You gonna charge for me, computer? Come on. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So small business people should be able to do that work for the postal service. If I'm if I have a small truck and I want to make a business, say I have a micro truck and I want to drive it hundred miles full of U.S. Postal Service stuff, and I can bid on a medium distance, I don't know what it is in the trucking business, but big truckers, what about them? They're not allowed to take that business. There's all these truckers out there in this country that because they don't have the business acumen and the oversight, and they're just really good drivers, and they're really good with their mileage, and they are really they really know how to take care of a truck, and they know how to fit into it and actually make a career out of it, it's almost impossible for them to get that kind of business. They don't have the kind of overhead to be able to manage bidding on a government contract like that, that's hard. So I just think there should be a really easy, open way for people to do that work for the U.S. Postal Service in the same way that right now the U.S. Postal Service, or at least until recently, I guess, used individuals to do mail routes in remote areas. And I believe they still do that. Okay. All right, so given that, sorry, you're not gonna see any more Hutzled for a while unless I can work something out or it's just gonna be really expensive. Nobody's gonna want it. Um, so this is the one we have. Thank you so much for people offering to send in and pay for the pay for the thing. This is gonna be for the next one, okay? So that's what it is. See, made in Golden, Colorado. So that's what that's what it's gonna be for. Um, that's what it's gonna be. The uh, the um, the next incarnation of this and some of the colors are so nice. Like the green one, oh, the green one came out really nice. Cause see, we're using this kind of, um, see this, this kind of rope here, it has a really nice look to it. And just with the plastic, I mean, now we have different colors of that too. And we can kind of change up with like little things, you know, like the little mini carabiner that holds the, uh, that holds the tensioner. The uh, the color of the of the um, 
graphics. It's just, some of them just look really nice. Okay, so we are gonna do another one, only this one's just gonna be the hut sled, I'm sorry, the snow wagon only. So from now on, I have a major branding problem. See, this is part of the problem. I mean, I'm actually going out there and building these sleds, okay? I'm not like somebody sitting in an office, be like, you know, where's the like, you know, boop, 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 you know, hello, hello yeah, manufacture me 5,000 more sleds, please. Oh, what's that? Oh, you have to go and slave more humans to do that? Oh, okay. Well, is that going to slow down my production at all? Couple prisoners to manufacture stuff for me. Okay, bye. See, that's what I'm talking about. By the way, this, this stuff, this stuff is the best. This stuff is so good. I had some friends of mine try a dirty dishwater. They really liked it. She got back to me. She said, it's a great drink. Okay. Oh, I guess I might as well tell you what dirty dishwater is in case, you know, okay. You get a martini shaker, you add crushed ice, you add a can of Mexican coconut water. Now Mexican coconut water, Mexican coconut water typically does not come from Mexico. It's typically from like Korea. Okay. So the difference between Mexican coconut water and other coconut waters is more coconut waters are more like healthy. They take the water out of like a more mature coconut. So Baby coconuts or younger coconuts have a sweeter water in them. So if you have Coco Frio, that has an, uh, a much sweeter taste. So what they do is they kind of fake it. They take the, the, the water out of more mature coconuts, but they add some sugar to it. And that just kind of makes it taste more like young coconut water. It's not as good as Coco Frio, but it's a close second. And you put crushed ice in the martini shaker. You add a whole can of that. So then you put it in. You add one of these guys, but do not use cherry. Okay, don't use this one. This one will ruin, this one will ruin your, uh, this one will ruin your, your dirty dishwater. So you use either unflavored or second best is lemon, third best, third best is orange. You can't really use the cherry. You can still use it for, you know, uh, I guess getting healthy or something, but you can't use it in that particular drink. And then there's raspberry lemon, which is, eh, it's all right. Uh, it's okay. It's, it's, you'll use it in like a pinch. Okay, so you shake that up. So crushed ice, the co Mexican coconut water that comes from Korea, one of those envelopes, two really, but just one. If you have one flavored, you can add two. You're fine. But if you have one of the flavors, don't add more than one. All right. The lemon, maybe you can get away with two. So the, when you get these ones, they usually come in only the raspberry lemon. You have to look for the ones that have the assortment and then or a some kind of Highball glass is really a good one to use. Use a highball glass, and then you pour it off the top. Don't pour it through the spout. You have to decant it because you want some of that crushed ice. That's very important. You don't want just the liquid. It's important to have a little bit of those tiny ice shards. By the time you finish shaking it, they're tiny. Don't use ice cubes. It has to be crushed ice. And don't use crushed ice from one of these like super expensive machines because then it's too small. You got to have the assortment. Big pieces and little pieces. So, like if you have, use the crushed ice from a typical refrigerator, that's perfect because it makes an assortment. If you see really big chunks in there, you know, take them out. Sometimes those are too big. All right, anyway, so you pour that into a highball cup and then you finish it with uh, plain seltzer. Don't use a flavor, it has to be plain. Just like plain seltzer water. Like just plain seltzer water. It doesn't have to be any flavor. It shouldn't be any flavor, man, because it'll ruin it. Okay, and, um, and that's a dirty dish water. You just top that off. And yeah, there's no alcohol in it. Unfortunately, I've tried a lot. I've yet to been able to figure out an alcohol that improves it. It's like it's you can kind you can sort of get away with it by adding vodka sort of works. Rum is actually really good in it. Um, but usually I look at the dirty dishwater as like your last drink of the night. So you you've drank a lot and then that's your last one. Like that's so that way instead of having that last one that's gonna make you feel sick in the morning, you skip a drink and it's and you're replenishing with the coconut water, you're replenishing like magnesium and potassium and then with the natural calm you're just getting an extra dose of ionic magnesium because the magnesium and the coconut water it's actually met, probably, most likely magnesium oxide it's not easily absorbed the magnesium from the natural calm and sometimes you can even get one that has calcium in it breaks apart from that little sugar molecule when you put it in there so it's ionic magnesium and it's more easily absorbed for your the health of your myelin sheath and your axon nervous system your axon nerves okay so uh so um yeah, dirty dishwater. So thanks very much for uh, supporting uh, this one. You guys are great. 
Um, the uh, I have five on the dock out there. So according to my sheet, these should be going out either ton. We're all finished, everybody. You're gonna you're gonna love these sleds. Look at this thing I invented. Isn't that great? I don't know what it does. I don't know what it does. You can do this. Oh, it looks kind of good. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of a jump rope, but bigger. I could probably make jump ropes out of this thing. I should make jump. I should make a jump rope. Those were good jump ropes when you were kids. Those were nice, man. Yeah, I should make a jump rope. Being nice and heavy, you really get a lot of speed with all this weight on it. This will make you work harder. Okay, well, uh, thanks again. Please look for the upcoming uh, snow wagon. Remember from now on, they are called snow wagons. They're called snow wagons because I can't really call them sleds anymore because that's confuses them with the snowmobiles. I can't wait. If somebody has a photo of using a snow wagon, you see, here's the problem, okay? I'm very concerned about anybody hooking one of these things up to their ATV, UTV, side-by-side, -side, or snowmobile, and then pulling people around on it. That really concerns me. And the reason is that I'm so concerned is if your sled, it's a safety issue. If say this is your snowmobile, your sled, all right, and it's connected to your sled, now you see the reason why I need better language. Okay, so I'm gonna use better language. So, here. Barbie watched when my daughter was just a little kid. Let me find something that looks more like a snow wagon. All right. Okay, this business card. And Black Warrior Printing in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. These were great printers. I really like those, those folks over there. Jackie and Virginia, they were awesome. Okay, so here's the snowmobile. Here's the wagon. Here's the sled. Here's the wagon. Snowmobile, quote sled. Snow wagon. Okay, so snowmobile. Snow wagon. Snow wagon. Snow wagon. This is a snow wagon. It's not really a hut sled anymore. This is a snow wagon, okay? So, person, and you're pulling it along, and you're like, oh, I'm having a good time, and say your track sees, <clears throat> okay? They're gonna keep sliding and jam into the back of your snowmobile. Okay, they're gonna hit their head on this, all right, so you, you can't safely tie somebody. There's two ways of combating this, okay? Number one, maybe you shouldn't put your kids or something important to you in a sled and start pulling it around. But the reality is sometimes you have to do that. For the same reason that sometimes you need a trailer on a truck and you can't put everything in the back of the truck, sometimes you can't put everything on your snowmobile. And sometimes people use these snow wagons to pull extra stuff that they can't fit on their, their snowmobile. That's just the reality, okay? So we're, we have to find ways of protecting. Do we recommend it? No. We recommend that you do not hook these up to your motorized equipment. We recommend that you just walk and hold them when they're walking. But people do use them for that, okay? So we can acknowledge that or pretend it doesn't exist. Well, if we were probably looking at, at – at uh, growing a big corporation, we would just pretend that nobody does it, okay? But we're not like that because we actually care about the people who buy these things because they care enough for us to call us up or send us a personal message saying they're going to cover the extra postage that our post office stuff, that our, that our postal just skyrocketed, okay? So we don't run a regular business. The relationships we have with the people who use our products are far more important to us than, our, than the profits, that's how it goes. That's the kind of business we're running. Okay, so because of that, I have to tell you things like this. I know that people are connecting these things up to their snowmobiles, okay, because I've seen it. 
All right, so here's what you gotta do. You need to put something against that back tread, not against, but something hanging in front of the back tread that will protect somebody or your gear if suddenly you have some kind of deceleration and it hits, okay? Now, to a degree, there's some certain amount of protection already from these because when the front hits, you can't really sit here. You know, it'll kind of work its way up and ideally stop. But that's not enough. Somebody still can get hurt. So you can take corrugated plastic or rubber or something like that, corrugated plastic or plywood is also a good choice, and you take a sheet of it, and you're going to need to cut some of it. You bend it so that you tie it onto the back of your sled so that if your sled suddenly stops, here, let me try to, here, I'll have to use this. Hey, I found a use for the cherry flavor. Okay, so say you, say you take some corrugated plastic and you bend it over the back of your sled and secure it with some bailing wire or something so that when you're pulling, or it would go something like this. The sled has tracks down here, obviously. Okay, so that when you're pulling your sled, if something happens, at least they won't hit your tracks, all right? At least they won't hit anything behind. Now, what if you have a gun rack extension on it or uh, a thing for your, for your extra gear? My sled has that. Well, don't put it on the back of the sled. Put it from the back of the extension because you don't want anybody to say hit their head on that thing. All right, so that's one. Another way of preventing accidents in that case is you can use – well, look on, our, look on the videos. You, we, we, when we sell the, uh, the back – I'll just go get one real quick. All right. So when we sell this guy, this is for the back country, which is for a much bigger sled than those, okay? So it comes like this, okay? Now, what is the purpose of this pole here? Okay, the purpose of this pole for the backcountry people, so you put it together, all right? You put one beaner on your belt loop. You put one on the right arm of the, of the sled, excuse me, the wagon. And there's another one just like this, so it comes with two of these. And you attach it so that when you're pulling it, this pole really does nothing. It adds a little bit of weight, but nothing more than that. All right, but when you stop, or if you're going down a hill, that's another problem. If you have a snow, if you have a snowmobile and you're going down a hill and you're pulling a sled, they're just going to keep going until they hit the back of your sled. Not just if you stop. Uh, it's possible that they could get so much speed from sliding down the hill that you may not recognize how close they're getting to your sled. Okay, so when a skier, a cross country skier, or a hut sledder, or a snow or a split boarder has a snow wagon or a hut sled, I can use hut sled, a hut sled behind, because those big ones are called the hut sled. Sometimes they crisscross them. So they have the right one going to the left of the sled and the left one going to the right of the sled. And this sometimes that gives them a little bit of extra control. Look, I'm holding a kayak paddle. Um, that keeps it from passing them, okay? So when they're pulling up a hill, this, this does nothing. Matter of fact, it even has extension on here. It's literally, it's not, it's not like a tent pole. Okay, this is a different device. Uh, so when they're going up a hill, this does nothing. When they're skiing straight, if they want to stop all of a sudden, at least the sled won't hit them in the back of the knees, right? But the main reason is when they're going downhill, because if they're going downhill and they're trying to keep control and suddenly their sled passes them, it's with ours, they try to keep control of it so that it doesn't pass them and give them problems. So one of the things you'll notice on these is oftentimes you have to adjust these a little bit depending on where you place it on your belt to even out the sled in the back because you want it to generally fly kind of even. Some people adjust these knots, that's also doable. Um, but, um, um, but you need to rig something like this up if you're doing that, we can't recommend it. Or all your beer for your, for your, uh, for your, um, for your lake party, whatever it is that you're doing. But especially if a kid's inside, um, you, Look, that's just the reality. I can't keep pretending like I think people don't do this. I know they do it because I've seen them do it. So that's just the reality. I can't keep pretending like I, I can't recommend it as the manufacturer of this product. I can't recommend the use of our product for that use because it's inherently 
unsafe if you have a child in anything but a car seat strapped into a car. And you guys should know that kids have to be protected to the ultimate, okay? Look, the reality is a lot of you guys are doing it. I know they are. So please, if you're tying it on to the back of your snowmobile or your ATV or any of those things, please use some kind of extension so that the sled doesn't slide into the back of your thing. Now, you're probably going to need one longer than this, all right? So what I recommend for that, and it will literally cost you no more than a few bucks, go to the Home Depot or the Lowe's or your local hardware store, True Value, Best Hardware Store, Best is a good one. Go to one of those or go to your mom and pop hardware store. Purchase two lengths of Schedule 40 pipe. If you want, this stuff is lighter. This isn't Schedule 40, but they use this for PEX, I think. Unfortunately, this one's made in China, which is one of those things. The, the PVC I usually get is made in, quote, America, which might means it's probably possibly made in Mexico, which I'm actually fine with. I'm always a supporter of Mexican economy. So uh, it's funny, the, the red one doesn't have writing on it, but the blue one does. Okay, so get two lengths of these, which are 10 feet each. I think these, these shorter ones, I think are, no, no, I think they are 10 feet. Or maybe they're nine feet. No, I think they're 10 feet. Yeah, they're 10 feet. You can't see them, them contrast against the snow. Knowing how far they are from you in some kind of whiteout conditions, get the red, get one red, one blue. You get one of these little connectors, okay? And you can glue it if you want. I choose not to, so it comes apart. You run your connection on one end. You just get some good, strong cord or rope, whatever you use. You should be able to fit it through the tube. You tie it into the other end. It would be twice as long as this thing. So they can trail 20 feet behind you. Now, if they're really barreling towards you, oh, is this thing really going to hold them back? Well, no, it will stretch up and it will break probably, and all kinds of things are gonna happen, but at minimum, it might even be a little better because I think it's less likely for this to break if you have one big pole for 10 feet. Right now, this is six feet long, which is actually a little less than six feet. This is like five and a half feet, which is a, a good length for backcountry skiers because they don't want it too long. They don't want it too short. Some of them cut it down and make it a little smaller. It just depends. Um, but for a snowmobile, you definitely want it somewhat longer. Now, if you combine this thing, all right, with the corrugated uh, plastic that I told you to shield the back of the sled so that the hot sled or the snow wagon doesn't slide into it, then you've already done two things to protect the occupants that you didn't do before. Now, is it worth it? Yes, it is worth it. They are your kids. You cannot let them crash into the back of a sled. And yes, I've been there. It has happened to me. I have crashed into the back of the sled. You have crashed into the back of the sled. We have both crashed into the back of the sled. Okay. We have both. We have done it. Okay. We know what an aggressive track on a Polaris Indy Trail tastes like. We know. Okay. We get it because we've tasted it not under our own accord. It's just something that happened, all right? But just because our parents did that way does not mean we need to do it that way. We need to be a little more protective of our kids because um, because uh, we just do. We just have to protect them a little better. I don't know why, but we do. All right, so I think that's it. Please keep an eye out for, wait, do we have anything else on this? Oh yeah. Yeah, this is a big one, okay. We already had a question. If this starts loosening up, usually it won't in the cold. What you can do is it means this knot is getting loose. So just open it up a little bit. Okay, just loosen it up. This is a slip knot. Okay, like that. All right. Get get like a pair of pliers or something. Not too aggressive, but but some kind of needle nose or something that you can, or maybe not too neat. You don't want it too small because. Um, it will, uh, it will hurt the rope. But grab this little tail end with your pliers and grab this end with your hands. Don't use a plier on both. You don't, wanna, you don't wanna rip the rope. And just tighten that knot up. And then when you tighten it up, it'll stay tighter. Okay. Now, why doesn't the ice leak out when you fill it up? And is it safe to put the ice in there? Yes, it's safe. And as Rick pointed out, thank you so much, Rick. I think I owe you a hut sled. It's naturally insulative, even in the summer, when you, can you see the, because it's corrugated. So there's, a, there's an air layer in there that acts as an insulator. 
Now, um, do we recommend any other insulators? So in the winter, yes, you can add some extra insulation to that. We might include it. Maybe we'll include it. If you're using it as a cooler for beer in the summer, or if you're using it as a floating little uh, beer stand, I think we might actually include that. Also just to give it a little extra buoyancy. Okay. I think we're good. By the way, this is gonna be a sad one, but I, I'm, 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 I'm as in the dark as anybody on this. Okay, what do the what do the massive increase in postal rates do to backpack barge? There's a lot of people who want a backpack barge now. We've gotten so many emails, and I just I had to get the I'm doing the winter product now, so I'm gonna have to start planning for the spring for backpack barge, but I don't know what our, our massively increased shipping is going to do to that product. I really don't know if we can afford to sell it anymore. We might have to go through a distributor or something. And I don't know if this product is able to go through. Last time I spoke to the backpack barge people. <laughs> the last time I spoke to the backpack barge people, I told him we we're going to do another one in the spring. And one person, really nice guy, forgot to send his address, so I still owe him a boat. So I'm going to have to do some level of production again on it. Okay. Doggy, sit. Sit. Oh, good girl. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be able to afford to sell these things anymore with the, with the shipping increase. I have no idea. And yeah, I know we can go through Amazon, but I've worked with Amazon and it just, it requires, it's not really user friendly for somebody like me. It's more somebody who's like a, has a, a kind of a logistics mind. They, they know how to make money on Amazon. Those, you know, also they're huge. I don't think they care one way or the other whether I'm selling my my boat through them or the sled through them. I don't think they care. You go on Amazon, there's like, you know, toaster ovens and weed whackers and, you know, it's like, you know, I'm sure you can even find made in USA obscure stuff in there. I get it. But, um, but, uh, it's, it's just not really set up for somebody like, like me. You know, it's just the reality. Okay, so as far as backpack barge, I don't know. We'll have to see. It's a big change. Just like, you know, we built our product around the United States Postal Service rates. Literally, and this is something I've never said, but I might as well say it now, now that the cat is out of the bag. I'd say two of my friends know what I'm about to tell everybody right now and everybody watching this. The backpack barge boat was designed around the limitations of the USPS box size. So it was designed to fit inside the largest box that I could find that would still be less than the overage rate, okay? So this is before when we were billing um, when they didn't build dimensionally. So because I'm a small manufacturer and because I'm not a, a great big wealthy company, I had to look for little, little clue, little, little special things like that to be able to bring value to our users. That's what was important. So that box size dictated where the folds went. It dictated the size of the boat. I mean, yeah, we had to make a very good boat. It's true, but there were some times when we, you know, we, we, we thought, okay, this one's good enough. We can give just a little more extra length to it. We can, just, we can just tweak this out just a little more before we run into the overage thing. So we did it every single time, every single time. If we could eke out just a little more value out of that product, so now that the, that the rates are dimensional, you know, it, it, 
at most it's um at most we might we might still be able to to sell them let's just see what happens okay and i guess that's it oh um we have another product coming out crunchy case and i'm probably going to include like maybe like i'll probably make it an option on the next kickstarter i'll let them do one crunchy case with the sled it'll probably be like the incentive are probably like crunchy case snow wagon snow wagon plus crunchy case yeah and uh we still have the uh the truck jewel i just that's gonna have to you want to see something really rare check this out pretty belt mountain bell though so it must be kind of new back then phones were property of uh the mountain bell corporation or the at&t or so i guess it's just on the edge yeah and you'd see on the bottom it would be engraved on that i had a landline for a while and my dad was still alive because i needed it for his um pacemaker and I said, wow, this is great having a landline. When the electricity goes out, I'm still going to be able to like call people, all my neighbors, and be like, oh, you have a landline. Can I call my sister-in-law in Cincinnati and tell her there's too much snow to come? Whatever, right? You think, you're gonna, you think that's actually going to happen? They're just sitting there paying them. Here's a landline I never use. Every single time somebody calls on it, they're like, you know, it's like you have a cell phone. Once you have a cell phone and you then add a landline to your life, it has no function. It's nice just to stand there and listen to the dial tone. It's nice to like uh, sometimes get a call on it that, you know, once in a while you might get a call of somebody that you're kind of interested in. It's always going to be a sales call or, or if you've had it before you had a cell phone, there's going to be a lot of people who call you on it. Okay. If you had your landline all the time, but if you added a landline back into your life because your old man needed it for his pacemaker or for some reason like that, I think they have cell phone attachments now, but at the time it's kind of cool because it's it's wired to the wall. Of course, you can get cordless, but that completely defeats it. It's wired to the wall, and you're standing there, and there's something awesome about it. But it turns out that when you get a power outage, the way that the uh, CenturyLink, in our case, powers that phone is through a network interface box, which needs power. <laughs> so unless you have a very old home where your phone is directly wired to the lines, I don't even know if such a thing exists anymore. I assume it still does somewhere. Uh, your phone's not going to work. <laughs> but the cell phone worked fine because I still had a charge in it. And the, the cell, um, I guess this is an FCC requirement. The cell towers have a battery or a fuel cell backup, or maybe in some cases a, a diesel generator backup, to run them uh, when the power goes out. Because I guess it has something to do with national security that people still have the ability to call and not freak out. It's like, oh, my God, the world's going to end. Oh, no. <laughs> the world isn't going to end. It's just that the New England Patriots were just beat again in the Super Bowl. Oh, okay. So the world's not ending. It's just a football riot. Yes, it's just a football riot. So, you know, that's the goal of that thing. Okay. I'm sure the New England Patriots won't lose again. Like, don't take that personally. I'm just pointing it out. Not a New England Patriots fan. I do love the Bruins. Okay. All right. How do I get talking about the uh, thing? All right. So do we have any other notices for any of the backers? Okay, we do. I had to remember this one. Two people contacted us about cPanel. Okay. So cPanel is has had a you might remember people who watch this channel regularly i did a mission statement for cpanel approximately six we're continuing the mission that we already started but we're doing it we're making a major change to the product in a way that we believe will allow for a more um market receptive product one that can integrate into markets and be manufactured on site. That has always been our goal. Okay, we, our, our goal has never been, oh, well, we'll manufacture in this factory in China. Well, if the people in China want to use 
a seat panel product, that's great. They should manufacture it in China. Okay, if the people in American Samoa want to use a seat panel, well, then they'll manufacture in American Samoa. If the people in Brazil want to use a seat panel, well, they'll manufacture in Brazil. If the people in Chicago or in Florida or in California want a seat panel, awesome. They can maybe get it. It might be manufactured in Chicago. It might be manufactured in Florida, but it's very likely going to be manufactured in American Samoa because American Samoa is part of our mission statement. American Samoa has, has been unfairly California that I mail from American Samoa is going to be much given the size of the package and the dimensional rates. It'll still be much more expensive coming from American Samoa on some level. I guess that's fair because it's a farther distance, but on another level, it's not fair because the American Samoans, and as they call themselves in some cases Samoans, which really worry people because, you know, are they part of, are they, are they, are, are we willing to do what we have to do to keep American Samoa part of America? Like bring them to a, a position that's as valued as a Pennsylvanian or a New Jerseyan or a Coloradoan or a Utah or an Oregonian or, or a, uh, I'm going to make an Australian joke here, or a New South Walesian. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, these, some, some of these states and foreign countries get more trade respect and more support from our government than American Samoa does. So are they part of our country or not? Well, if they're part of our country, which I believe they are, then they deserve to have citizenship. They deserve to have postal rates that allow, that allow them to compete with companies in California and New Jersey and Texas. Okay, and Puerto Rico's in the same boat. Maybe not as bad as American Samoa. At least they're citizens, not quote nationals. I mean, American Samoan citizenship doesn't transfer to their kids because they're a national. They're considered a national, and it's just ridiculous. So yes, if you purchase a C panel American Samoa, I wouldn't put that above anybody. Okay, just because American Samoa already has so little respect. All right, you know it's just insane how little respect American Samoa gets from, I don't even want to say it's American government. It's just all of us. It's just all of us. And you know, it's, it's worse than lack of respect in a way. It's like, remember that, that um, part in um, that movie, The Breakfast Club, where the guys, they were talking about, I guess it was the wrestler was talking to the, uh, the Ali Sheedy lady with the hair, right? And she, he was going, oh, I think I might be messing up on the characters. Or I think that was it, though. He said, oh, you know what, they abuse you. It's more about just not even being on our radar. At least if we said, look, all those goddamn American Samoans with their awesome culture and their, their fantastic ocean views and their great style and their amazing seafood and their, and their beautiful landscapes. Oh, we're so jealous of them. We hate them. Let's just ignore them, right? But it's not like that. It's more just like, what, they're Americans? It's like, that's worse. That's worse than ignoring them. Okay, so yeah, hopefully the C-panels that somebody in Chicago or Florida or California buys will be made in American Samoa. That's the eventual goal. All right. But uh, so that's the change we're making is, is because we have to fit to that business model where we manufacture in the state of origin and in the state of use, we had to modify the product in such a way. Now, why? Because it turns out you can't ship certain kinds of material to certain places. I can ship whatever I want to Shanghai, but I can't ship whatever I want to Ghana. Well, maybe not. Ghana's pretty close to the ocean. Say um, uh, Burkina Faso. It's kind of up in the hills. It's expensive to ship stuff there. If we want to get this stuff to Burkina Faso, it has to be something that's amenable to being shipped, but also, ideally, there has to be some locally sourced materials in Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso to make key components for these things. So that's always a process of simplifying our design constantly. The engineering on it is overwhelming because when you simplify a design, many times you're going to hit the performance of it. Well, part of our mission statement, unfortunately, that's like our constitution for what we're doing. It says we can't do that. We, if we make an improvement to the manufacturability, if we make an improvement to the um, – to the uh, logistics comfort level of that product, that it can't impact the uh, production of that device. 
So it's really a constraint. You know, it's like that Wordsworth poem, like the, can the bees buzz in the farthest reaches of furnace fells, but instead they like hang around that bush, right? The words, I think that was Wordsworth, but a sonnet. It's like a corporation has the world, right? But in the sonnet, it's like that's a corporation that constricts themselves in a very tight set of rules. Well, that set of rules is what defines your ethical reach as a company. Because I'm quite sure when some of these companies started out, who ended up, unfortunately, in some cases, causing more harm than good, they started out with the best of intentions, but that's just what happens. Sometimes companies cause more harm than good because they don't have a strong set of rules governing the decisions that they make. And when you're guided by profits, unfortunately, you're going to sometimes make decisions where the profits beat out your ethical restrictions. And that's what it is like with a sonnet. You have a very strict set of rules when you write a sonnet. It's, it's a poem with really strict meter and rhyme. And, and when you work within those set of rules, as Wordsworth says in that poem, that's when things really begin to flower. The bees could go anywhere, but they prefer to stay in the little honeysuckle or whatever it is. And that's that's what the that's what the um, that's what the advantage of being a, a a social corporation. But you know, social corporation doesn't mean anything. Just be, just have a strong set of values, have a set of rules that are going that you're going to use to define what you're doing because if you do the opportunity there is incredible you can make some money you can go to sleep at night without tossing and turning wondering if you're doing the right thing you can get customers who contact you and say hey i'll pay extra for the shipping that sucks that you have to do that and even better than that you're going to be in the position where you don't have to accept it Okay, where you just appreciate it for the kindness, for that generosity without having to accept it. And you still get it out on time and you still give them a lot of value. But it's but 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 you're working in a sonnet. So there's going to be all kinds of things that you're never going to be able to get involved with because they won't fit the model. There's always going to be all these structures and ideas you want to fit into that sonnet. You're eventually you're just going to have to throw them out. They won't fit. It doesn't fit the rules. Okay, so that's what's going on with CPanel. Um, we finished Galaxy Gauge uh, Kickstarter, and that was awesome. So a bunch of people got a bunch of rulers and gauges and posters and stuff. So I think they're going to like that. I'm hoping to get that out quick. I don't want that sitting around too long because I want to get these out so I can get the next one going. And now and I, here's how I'm going to apologize. On the 4x7 people, I was supposed to be doing a – the next 4x7 project was supposed to be a fix-it clip, and I have not got that one up yet. I really apologize, but I'm going to. I'm just backed up on all this other work. So the fix-it clip is still on the agenda. It's still the next product. I just haven't gotten to it. I apologize. Okay. Actually, I, but, but what's holding me up is I still have to send my cousin a set because I made a special set for my cousin, and I haven't gotten that out to her yet. Um. I'm going to like print out like a sample so she can see how it's done. If anybody has any questions about those four by sevens, please contact me. All right. I think that's it. Oh, as far as the research goes. So the, um, the particulate bimodal distribution that was, um, Rejected, unfortunately, by the journal that I sent it to. There were some slight problems with it. I fixed them. They weren't a big deal, but I asked them, and they said I can't resubmit to that journal, so I'm going to resubmit to a different journal, and we'll uh, hopefully they'll hopefully they'll publish it because you know once I get rejection, I get all emotional, like oh I suck, I'm like the worst scientist ever, I don't know physics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, you gotta you start thinking you suck. You take it's hard. Rejection is hard. But you know, you go back and look at your work. Like, ah, what am I talking about? This is good. This is good work. And their objections were rather small, so um, it's fine. I've got. I go through this every time I get something published. I'm like, oh, nobody's ever gonna publish. And it gets rejected. And I send to second place. Sometimes they reject it. And I send to third. And a lot of times, by the time I get to the third, usually like the second time they'll pick it up, or oftentimes the third. If you just keep trying and trying, eventually you you get it published. It's all right. So um, so that one I have to resubmit. 
Um, I, uh, I've already written about the, um, the high efficiency two cycle engine and how that could possibly integrate into an energy infrastructure. There's a lot of opportunity there. We have this ingrained motion, notion that two cycle, two stroke engines are inherently filthy. And in many cases they were, but uh, there's a lot of people doing research on two stroke, high efficiency two strokes. And there's a lot of opportunity there. If you look at the amount of, of weight that they save and the simplicity in the device, it's, potent, it's possible if you have a very narrow range of operating conditions that you can dramatically improve the efficiency of those. Now, is it going to work? I don't know. Do I think it's going to work? I think it's going to work. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for two-stroke engines. Because you have a, a much higher energy density of the engine itself, you can potentially have a very high efficiency of the uh, time, time test. But if you can set your operating conditions to such a degree that the harmonics of the combustion match the physical envelope that the combustion occurs, you can maximize the efficiency. So what that means is, is it's, it's a, it's a nonlinear differential. And the reason it's a nonlinear differential is because your piston is moving this way, or say, we'll say a conventional engine, your pist there, this is your piston. Your piston's moving up and down in a cone. Yeah. So it's, it's moving up and down as the combustion happens. So in your two stroke, you, in your two cycle engine, you get the combustion, it pushes down the piston and then it comes back up to compress it. And then detonation, compression, detonation, compression, detonation, compression. So there's naturally the, the cylinder size, in some cases it's not even a cylinder, but a varying shape. The cylinder size is changing as the combustion front changes. So there's a natural harmonic to this whole process because there's a speed, an inherent speed, when the fuel's coming in off of your injector or your carburetor, that it, um, that the combustion front is able to move through it. There's a characteristic speed that's dependent on the pressure and the temperature and the turbulence of the uh, air fuel mixture and how long it has to combust before that exhaust port opens. So if it opens too soon or if it opens too late, you can't match that harmonic and you're getting unburned fuel into the exhaust or you're pulling the exhaust back into the engine, which sometimes can, will shield the reaction. So it's really, really difficult. A four stroke, you have a lot more flexibility with being able to optimize that combustion. A two stroke is razor's edge combustion. It's really hard. And there's a reason why they're dirty because they're hard to make clean, but that doesn't mean they can't be made clean. It means they're hard to make clean. Do, will we be successful? I don't know. We might fail. That's okay. Hopefully I try things where I know there's a chance I might fail because if I'm trying things where I know I'm going to be, I'm going to succeed. That means there's a reason why, wait a minute. If I try something where I know I'm going to succeed, that's probably not a good problem. There has to be a risk that you might fail because if you know you're going to succeed, it's no longer a problem. It's, it's just a, it's an exercise. And the great opportunities are in the problems. That's a Chinese philosophy, I think. That you just, in your, when you speak about problems, you need to change the word. Uh, Rob's, yeah. Anyway, I won't say her name, it's fine. She's a great person. Um, she kind of just stuck that word in there, which always been a big help for me. I really like that she did that. Um, she said, when you say the word problem, just insert the word opportunity. It's a Chinese philosophy. I think that the, the script for problem and opportunity is the same maybe in China. I don't know what it is, but I, I appreciate their, that culture and how they dislike I have for Chinese manufacturing. But I have a deep love and respect for Chinese culture because I've been really fortunate to be around a lot of Chinese physicists and mathematicians as well, and, and a lot of Chinese scientists and Chinese artists. And it's kind of, um, it's hard, be, on one hand, feeling like you're almost kind of anti-Chinese when I talk about the methods they use for manufacturing and uh, 
uh, but they're serving a need to a degree. A lot of times they're also giving us stuff we didn't even know we needed um, or want. <laughs> but the culture itself is fine. I don't mean to. I don't mean to extend that uh, critique I have of how American manufacturers do all their manuf do much in their manufacturing in China. If they want to do it, that's fine. I just, I just, I don't agree with it. I think there's a better way of doing it. Okay, signing out. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>